It's recording. Blackman Parish Council, April the 23rd, I'm sorry, April the 13th, 2023. Special meeting is now called to order. Uh, we have roll call. Let the record reflect that seven council members are present. Uh, Reverend Edwards and Dr. Gooey are absent. We will rise for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mr. Ronnie Lutzum. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item two, please. Agenda item two, new business. A, interview of applicants for the council attorney position one, Avery M. Riley, Jr. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Uh, Mr. Riley. Uh, at this time, we will ask Mr. Garrett to step out. You can come sit up Mr. here. Mr. Riley. Would you like him to come in or at the podium? Oh, he can, he can sit down right okay. there. Oh, he's coming. Yeah, That's right great. There, so. Yeah. Sit in the hot seat. Oh. Before we can use that mic. Uh, before we begin, uh, you would like to give any opening statement? First, I'd like to start by saying good morning. Um, I also like to thank you all for this opportunity, allowing me to to interview and uh, present myself to you all as uh, as why I feel I'm the best candidate for this position. Um, really briefly, I'm not going to go too far into detail. You already have my, my resume and everything, but just a quick background on me. Uh, born and raised in Plaquemines Parish, educated right here in Plaquemines Parish School System, graduate of Bell Chase High School, graduate of Louisiana State University, Southern University Law School graduate. Um, currently, I, I work here in the parish as a um, public defender here at the public defender's office. Been doing that for the past three years. Um, also, I'm currently a member of the uh, United States Army Reserves, where uh, I get to proudly serve in the 441 Transportation Unit out of New Orleans East. Um, anything else, I'm an open book. I'm ready to get started. You, you guys can ask me whatever questions you have, and I'll be more than happy to answer to the best of my ability and as openly as and honestly as I can. Thank you, Mr. Raleigh, for your open statement. Uh, is there any questions from, let the record reflect that Reverend Evans is present. Yes, sir. I have him down. Uh, any questions from the board, uh, please cue in. We'll start with Ms. McCarthy. Hello, Mr. Riley. Good morning. Where in Plaquemines do you reside? I live in uh, the Jesuit Bend area. Okay. Right. Currently, um, as far as districts go, it will be District 8. Okay. Um, and you said you're currently a public defender in the parish? That is correct. And you work with the DA's office? Correct. They are on the, the opposing side. So they are the ones that prosecute the cases. I'm the one who defends the, uh, the, the accused. What type of cases has you, have you um, defended that you think gives you some knowledge of what the council might need from an attorney. Can you think of anything? Uh, as far as cases that I've defended, actually, it, it's, a, it's a completely different world, I'll be honest with you. It, um, it's, it's a criminal world. Mm -hmm. So I've defended all types of cases, everything from you know, misdemeanor theft out of Dollar General up to more serious cases such as um, drug distribution, um, murder, aggravated batteries, things of that nature. So none of those directly would uh, relate to what the council's needs are. However, um, in regards to what I feel would qualify me to handle the needs of the council would be my education. Education, uh, as far as going to law school, graduating, passing the bar exam, I have an understanding of how the law works. I understand how to find applicable law, how to interpret said law, um, how to apply it to the situation as needed. So I guess to better answer your question, nothing that I do in my daily work right now necessarily correlates with this. However, I do feel that I possess the skill set necessary to, um, to do the work. And if I don't have the answers to something, I have the ability to find those answers. 
How long have you been practicing? Um, so I've been licensed. I was sworn in in May of 2018. Uh, so I've been practicing a little over about four years altogether. I've been with the public defender's office specifically for the past little over three years. Where else have you worked? So before the public defender's office, I worked, um, my first job as an attorney, I worked for a while with Morris Bart. Uh, from there, I left, there was a job opening in the uh, Orleans Parish uh, District Attorney's Office. So I prosecuted there for a little while, and then the, uh, the job opened up in Plaquemines Parish to come and work for the public defender's office, so I left and came here. Um, more specifically, I guess, would be when I first came out of law school, my, my plan was always to come back and work in Plaquemines Parish. Uh, when I first got out, there, were, there was no one hiring at the time, I basically knocked on every door in town, uh, all the law firm, the DA's office, parish attorney's office, public defender's office, nobody was hiring. Um, so from there, I just was looking for work at that point. Uh, I went and I worked for the parish as a, a supervisor in the human resources department. From there, I finally got my first opportunity to go and practice law at Morris Bart. Um, then again, like I said, my goal was always to make it back to Plaquemines. And I knew I was most likely going to be involved in the criminal aspect when I first came in. So when the job opened up with Arlene's, I saw it as an opportunity to get some experience in the criminal world in case, um, or for when the day came that a job opened up either with the DA's office or the public defender's office. So I took that job. Um, then a few months after that, probably about six months after I had been with Arlene's Parish, uh, my resume was still on file with the public defender's office and they started hiring again and I was the first person they called. So as soon as they called me, I was like, absolutely, uh, let me put in my two weeks and I'll be ready to roll. So I've been here ever since. Okay. Now, I like to see people who can think out of the box. So I'm going to ask you to um, look at the totality of your experience in the three different or four different locations and tell me what can you bring to our council office that you have seen used in other locations that we might not be doing or that or what would you do different if there is something that you would do different um, as far as advising and I know that there is a strict contract so you may not be able to do that, but I just want to know your observations. Well, for one, I believe I bring a fresh set of eyes. Um, trust me, I understand. I'm, I'm younger than Mr. Garrett. I'm, I'm younger than most other attorneys that you all probably deal with on a regular basis. So I do think that I bring a fresh perspective. I bring, um, um, you know, I look at things. I look at things from a completely different perspective also. So I would definitely bring new ideas, innovative ideas, uh, creative ways of looking at things. Um, I do understand that I work for you all. If I, were to, if I were to be given the position, I work for you all. However, it, is, it wouldn't be my job to necessarily tell you what you want to hear. I don't have a problem with letting you know exactly what your options are, what you can and can't do, and then allowing you to make your decision based on that. So I guess the biggest thing I feel I bring is a new perspective, fresh set of eyes, and also I bring the integrity to stand up to you when need be. Um, so don't get me wrong, I will be fully committed to, to handling the needs and, and the tasks that you all assign to me, but at the same time, I'm, I'm not a person who's afraid to basically tell it like it is and let you know exactly what you should or shouldn't do, what you can and can't do. So I definitely have no problem with um, asserting myself and, and um, at the end of the day doing what's right. Okay, let's turn to uh, billable hours in a case scenario. Let's say a council member asked you to go look up something you would respond to that. Would you continue to look beyond what the council member has asked you to do to c create billable hours? No, absolutely not. I, I wouldn't sit there and rack up billable hours just for the sake of draining the pockets. I definitely wouldn't do that. Okay. Now, however, um, at the same time, I would not be the type of person who would say, okay, this is what they asked me to do. I'm going to do that and nothing more. If there is more that needs to be done, you know, you may ask me for a simple answer, but oftentimes, especially in the legal world, there are no simple answers. Sometimes there requires more to be done. I can sit up here and tell you, okay, yes, this is what you can do, but there's also this that you have to be concerned with, this that you have to be concerned with, and so forth and so forth. So I wouldn't sit there and just try to drain the pockets and just run up billable hours, but I will make sure that the answer that I give you is a thorough and a complete answer, and it, and it fully encompasses all uh, foreseeable scenarios that you could uh, run across. So let's say you are asked to research item A. Mm -hmm. 
and you see that there are ancillary issues here that lead to B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. Would you come back to the council member and say, these are additional things that I think we should look at and go, before you go do it, or would you go ahead and do it and bill it? Well, I guess I would bring it to your attention first because at the end of the day, if I'm going to be billing you for it, I'm going to be charging you for it, I think you have the, um, you have the right to say whether or not this is something you're willing to pay for. Right. So before I just go ahead and put in the legwork, I'll do what you asked me to do first. Right. Then I'll come back to you and say, hey, Ms. Patty, also we need to take a look at this. I didn't go forward and, and complete the task yet, but I think you might want to consider this, this, and this because these are things that could come up. Now, if you want me to go ahead and run those scenarios, then I'll go ahead and do so at that point. Thank you. I, I appreciate that answer. Okay. Um, if you were to be our council attorney, it sounds like it would be your first time being in private practice. Is that correct? That's correct, ma'am. Okay. Um, do you have other jobs that you might take on at the same time? Um, would you go and, and be a public defender as well? Yes, that's correct. That would, that would be my intention. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and would you practice here in Plaquemines Parish? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what is the rate that you would expect to have as a council attorney? I'm sorry, the... The, the rate for your billable hours. Uh, as far as the, the pricing? Yes. What I would charge per hour? Yes. Um, honestly, I don't have a price for you, but I can guarantee that it would be a fair price and it would definitely be due to the fact that I understand that um, I may not be as seasoned of an attorney as some other candidates, um, I can guarantee that it would be, I would be one of the more affordable options for the, for the council. I can't give you an exact price at this point, but I can guarantee that it would be one of the more affordable options. So would you be willing to renegotiate the contract that we currently have standing? Absolutely. Okay. And if you came up to a wall where you didn't know where to turn, do you have resources, professors, other people that you could turn to and say, what do you think about this? Yes, ma'am, I do. I Excellent. Do. Well, thank you. I yield. Mr. Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Riley, I want to thank you for coming and interviewing. Uh, this process took. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. My screen is all where I came request to speak. Okay, I'll, I'll have you. Please cue in again, Mr. Newsom. You have the floor. We had to add him to the attendance. Okay. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, let me start. Thank you, Mr. Riley, for applying and coming to interview. I know it was a longer process than any of us really wanted, but uh, it was. We, well, again, I want to thank you. I know you thank that, but um, I've read your uh, resume. It's you, you're very impressive. I'll say that it's very impressive. Thank you. Um, plus, uh, you're a proud graduate of Bell Chase High School, as, as well as I was. I'm a, you talked about your age. Don't ever apologize for your age. You know, I'm a little bit older. You can tell by my hair. You know, I'm older. But anyway, um, it, it, I'd like to see you speak on. Uh, I, I see you worked for the parish as a human resource supervisor. Can you elaborate on? on some of your duties there, I've read them, but can you elaborate on some of that? So working with the parish as human resources supervisor, um, some of the things that we dealt with um, were as far as getting everyone's benefits and everything together, making sure that everybody was uh, properly signed up and enrolled uh, when it was time to do so. Also, I dealt a lot with, um, with the employees directly. So oftentimes you would have a particular supervisor may write up one of his subordinates and then that would come through our office and we would um, uh, conduct investigation into that situation bring in those employees and, and try to get to the bottom of what, you know, what went on. So it was a lot of, a lot of people managing, a lot of dealing with people, a lot of moving parts and, and things of that nature and working with other uh, departments, um, working with civil service, attending civil service meetings, sometimes parish meetings, council meetings, um, and things of that nature. So a large part of it was definitely dealing with uh, people in a real hands-on way, a real hands-on nature. Thank you. Yes, I've... Uh... Like I said, your resume is very impressive. I was um, listening to you speak at some political forums, and again, I was uh, extremely impressed with that. So you're, you're, you're doing a wonderful job. Uh, I'm watching the courtroom. You you're handle yourself extremely well. Uh, I miss Patty asked some of my questions. Thank you, Miss Patty. No, I took notes on it too, so I have some I have some questions. But uh, so again, I just uh, want to thank you, and um, that's all I have for right now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jeritich. 
How you doing, Mr. Riley? Doing all right, Mr. Jones. I had the pleasure of running against you in District 8, and what impressed me the most is the way you spoke, the way you handled yourself, and the way we became, you know, acquainted. And, and you know, I was, it was a pleasure meeting you at that yes, likewise. time. Likewise. And I know since then I've seen you at events. You attend things throughout the parish. And I do know that your heart is in this parish because when we spoke, you know, we talked about that a lot. Man, you had a lot of the same views. Yes, sir. And I appreciate that in you because what that gives me is confidence that you're willing to do what's right. And this is Plaquemines Parish, and this is where you reside. Absolutely. Uh, one of the questions I have, and it's just a simple question, and, and don't take it in any wrong fashion. You know, we have contracts, but we can also hire at will. If that was the case because we wanted to test the waters, would you be willing to be an at-will employee? Yes, sir. Uh, and your involvement in the parish itself, uh, you know, you've been involved with several things. Can you elaborate on some of the things that you may have been, you know, outside of the you know, attorney world and stuff like that? Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, well, prior to COVID, um, I was actually going on weekends to South Plaque Elementary, and I was helping out with the tutoring, getting the kids ready for state testing and things like that. We were going down on Saturdays, and it was probably about, two to three hours on Saturday mornings uh, and we started getting a very good turnout of kids and it was very productive. Uh, I had a chance to speak with some of the the teachers and, and staff members uh, later on down the line and they were just telling me how well it helped the kids, how their test scores improved and how the kids really responded to having a, a positive um, male figure uh, present. Also this was it last weekend I believe I attended career day at South Plaque High School and um, myself and several other people who were predominantly from Plaquemines Parish and working in different endeavors we went and met with the kids at the high school and um, uh, talked to them about our careers and, and got some of their interest and gave them advice on how to go about doing different things in life and, and stuff of that nature. Um, also uh, just active throughout the parish um, I attend church in the parish. We always we have uh, several different church functions that we that we put on. I, I'm, a, I'm a member of uh, Greater St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church in Oakville, Louisiana. So we we always I'm always involved in things of the um, things dealing with the church as far as like vacation, Bible school, and things of that nature. Teaching classes. I usually um, I'm usually assigned to teach the uh, the young teenage group. So uh, I'm always always around always got my hands in something one way or another and uh, I'm not hard to find anybody who knows me knows I'm a, I'm a hands-on person I'm easy to reach easily easy to contact easy to talk to uh, as far as just to give you an example dealing with uh, with the public defender's office when I meet clients I don't even give them the office number I give them my cell phone number I want to be able to talk to you if you have a question comment concern I want you to be able to get to me whenever you need to. Uh, sometimes that comes back to bite me when you have clients calling at uh, midnight on a Saturday, but you know it, it's it's what I signed up for, and that's just the commitment that I have to my clients. Uh, that's one of the reasons why um, my name is the name that floats around the jail. This is the attorney you want to get on your case, but because I just have that personal relationship with my clients, I'm I'm committed to what I do and the people that I serve, and it would be my full intention to bring that same commitment to you all if I'm um, if you all decide to hire me as the special counsel. Yeah, we have several hot issues on the table right now that are being handled. And if chosen, you would be responsible to pick up those duties. Yes, sir. And do you feel like you would be able to quickly consume what's been out there and, and move forward with it? Yes, sir. That'll be my intention. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Jersich. Mr. Schultz. Mr. Riley, I too was at those forums and very impressed. I was in the audience when y'all y'all had the debate, whatever you want to call it. Uh, very impressed with you, your resume. Um, just a quick clarification: if you were chosen, what you would go into private practice or stay with the public defender's office? I would remain with the public defender's office. That would okay. be my intention. My question is: would there be any conflicts with? Uh, I don't know. I haven't researched. I, I just thought about this as you were talking, but uh, dual office. Correct. Since you're working so, for the parish and public defenders. Understood. So actually, I don't believe that would be a conflict. Um, when I was running for council, as a matter of fact, I, um, I had an opinion taken up with the attorney general's office. They came back and told me that it was not a conflict. I could be a public defender as well as a councilman. Uh, I believe that same 
concept would apply in this case. However, to be on the safe side, I did take the liberty approximately two to three weeks ago and requested another opinion on this specific uh, matter. So I'm actually waiting on that opinion to come back from the Attorney General's office. I'm fully confident that it will say there's no conflict, but I wanted to have that hard documented proof from the Attorney General's office saying that it was a green light. So okay. I'm waiting on that to come back any day now. Yeah, I, I, I would think the same thing. If they gave you the approval to Ryan's counsel, I would assume this is less <laughs> involved. But uh, thank you for taking that initiative, actually, and yes, sir. checking into it beforehand. Yes, sir. Thank you. Reverend Edwards. Good morning. Uh, Brother Riley, unlike these other council members, I didn't tend any of your debates, but I've been knowing you all your life. I know your mother, your father, and I know your history, so I'm excited just to see you sitting here with this opportunity. As, as I was looking at your resume, um, and this relates to negotiation skill, uh, I saw that you're a multitask person because you're on both sides. I was glad you're here at being working with the DA office, being a public defender, you have eyes on both sides, so that gives you a, a rich experience. The other part that I, I think um, I looked at on your resume is that you relate your human resources. Mm -hmm. This council have a lot of personalities. Right. Let me make that clear. And everybody who have been in your position, who worked, know you got to deal with a lot of personality. So I think your experience in human research would help you deal with all of our uh, personality. Uh, the, the other thing that I want to ask you, yo, how do you see your military experience helping you in your role in being this uh, council attorney, your, your military experience? Honestly, I feel that um, it just show, it, it shows commitment. It's a matter of commitment. And I'm committed to my country, committed to my community, committed to my parish, and I will be committed to you all. Uh, I, I believe that's probably the, the biggest thing that, um, that I think re relates in terms of that. Also, the military experience, um, just like you mentioned, there's multiple personalities on the, on the council. There's multiple, multiple personalities in the, uh, in the military, as a matter of fact. Um, and to be honest with you, this, this evening, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be um, hopping on a bus headed to, uh, to Indiana for two weeks for our annual two-week training. So we're going to be out there sleeping in tents, a bunch of different personalities all um, surrounded by each other for two weeks. So it definitely helps uh, being able to navigate being around different people from different parts of the world um, and just being able to get along and, and work together to accomplish a common goal. Okay. okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I've seen so much stuff because um, Miss Patty was asking you a question about experience, but I think your experience in, in your role as a public defender, you're dealing with a lot of people. Yes, sir. And you have to be multitask because no case is the same, right? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, even if it may be the same charges, the facts in every case are always different. Um, speaking to multitasking, so currently I'm the only full-time attorney at the Public Defender's Office, so I, have, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, if you're familiar with the way our, our 25th Judicial District is broken down, we have two divisions, Ju uh, Division A with Judge Connor, Division B with Judge Clement. Um, in those divisions... Judge Connor has misdemeanors. Judge Connor has felonies. I deal in both of them. Judge Clement has misdemeanors. Judge Clement has felonies. Judge Clement has um, juveniles. I deal with all three of those. So, uh, and also, Judge Connor has uh, has the drug court program, which I'm the attorney who who um, handles the drug court program. Some days we have court in both sections. I may be doing felonies in Division B, and I may have misdemeanors going on in Division A, and I'm back and forth. Go and deal with one client, deal with one judge and one DA switch over to the next one, change over, uh, look into that case and, and handle that one. So I'm, I'm constantly multitasking, uh, running back and forth. So this is, this is basically what I do on a normal basis. Well, the other thing is, um, I think is it really important, and I think Mr. Jewer alluded to it, um, in law, the word uh, equity and integrity, fairness and justice, those words have true meaning. How, how would that help you, those words, in your relationship being, if you select it, how would these key terms I use help you in your, in your job as our counsel? Well, not only do they help me, I think those are the words that I 
I'm guided by in my profession, equity, fairness, justice. I mean, that's that's the oath that I took when I was sworn in um, to the to the bar association that that governs every aspect of um, your life as an attorney, equity, fairness, justice, um, equality, things of that nature. So as far as relates to the council, I think that would be best applied in the sense that um, if I'm working for the council, I work for all of you. Uh, there's no one councilman, oh, I like this councilman, so I'm going to put a little more emphasis on what he wants. I don't like this one, so I'll get to him when I get to him. No, uh, I'm, at all, I'm at you all's disposal. Um, no impartiality um, whatsoever. So um, equity, fairness, justice, that, that applies to everything that I do. Your last statement, I will conclude with your answer to my last question. Thank you. Mr. Conovich. I'd just like to say thank you for coming and interviewing. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for your service with the reserves. And I've always told you I thought highly of you, and I see a bright future for you here in Plaquemines Parish, and I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Don't have any questions for you, but just wanted you to know that. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Newsom. Yes, me again. Well, Mr. Riley, I want to apologize. I didn't thank you for your service. It's it's extremely thank you. That, that was a, that's an honorable thing you do with the reserves, and it's it's wonderful. I'm going to thank you. Thank you for your support. Uh, while I was listening, Reverend Edwards, you, when he's at the courthouse, Rep, maybe you can help him out. And, you know, he wears a lot of hats over there. Why you that? So, <laughs> so with that, with with, with your. Uh, <laughs> Vast job duties that you have with, with Division A, Division B, uh, running around. Do you, do you have any issues where it would fe where it would interfere with any of the council meetings? You know, the first, the, the second Tuesday of the month is in Bell Chase, and the fourth Tuesday of the month, uh, I'm sorry, Thursday is in uh, Point Lahash. So no, no, sir, not at all. Um, actually, the Point Lahash days would be perfect because I'm already there, so I'll just yeah. come on down once we, once we wrap up. As far as the uh, the Bell Chase meetings, I don't see that being a problem at all. Uh, typically, we're usually done with court by 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon anyway, so it, it really wouldn't interfere in, in any way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Mr. Schultz. Mr. Newsom actually took my question because uh, I had a sex. <laughs> great mind thinks alike. Uh, and then, I mean, again, thank you for your service. Uh, I didn't see you. I, I, I remember that you did say that when you ran, ran, but can you just give a quick overview of your military? I, I just want, I didn't see it on your resume, just. Correct, yeah, so uh, currently I am a, I'm a reservist, again, with the uh, the 441 Transportation Company. I'm a specialist in that unit, the E4. Um, uh, my MOS, I'm actually a truck driver in the, uh, in the military, completely, complete 180 from what I do in my daily life. Um, a lot of people ask me why that when I do this in my real life. I'm like, because I just want to do something different when I leave out of the courtroom. You know, that's uh, that's basically what it comes down to. Um, that's, that's really all it is. Mr. Champagne? Yes, uh, I don't know if you know I'm a retired Army officer as well, and I want to thank you for your service. It speaks volumes about your commitment to not only Blackman's Parish but to our country. Thank you for your service, sir. Thank you, sir. Any more questions from the table? Well, Mr. Riley, I would like to thank you for to participating in the interview, but I also would like to thank you for your dedication, your service, uh, volunteering, the tutoring, and also, most importantly, I would like to thank you for being a role model for the young black, especially the young blacks, uh, men in this parish. Thank you. With that, I'll end, end the interview. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. LaFrance. Thank you all. Could you please call uh, Mr. Danny? <clears throat>
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Garrett, would you like to give an opening statement? Uh, sure. Um, I think all of you know me, Danny Garrett. Um, I have worked for the council since about 2016. Um, through, so this would be sort of the third iteration, I think, of the council that I've worked for. Um, my background is local government. Um, went to work for the Louisiana Municipal Association uh, back in the 90s, uh, doing, starting out just doing litigation for them. Ultimately moved into the other side of the governmental law side of that and the governmental relations side. Kind of got recruited away to the House uh, Committee on House and Governmental Affairs during the 2000 redistricting cycle, mainly because I had testified in front of that committee a lot on ethics, public records, open meetings, all the stuff that I handled for the LMA and for the municipalities, then got recruited back away from the legislature to the Police Jury Association. I was there for about a decade, uh, ultimately left there after becoming general counsel, opened up my own office in February 2011, and with the exception of a couple of years where I kind of got recruited over to the Butler Snow Law Firm because they were opening up a Baton Rouge office and wanted a governmental law presence. And so I'd never been in a big law firm setting, so I gave it an opportunity. I ultimately decided it just wasn't for me. It didn't fit what I did, uh, mainly because they wanted to bill me out at a much higher hourly rate than local governments pay in Louisiana. And uh, plus, there was a lot of overhead with regard to a large law firm. Left on good terms, I still deal with them on a good on you know on a, on a lot of things, and so we've still cooperated on stuff. But I just sort of fell into local government and have been doing it now for 25 plus years. I uh, I have clients that range from Madison Parish Police Jury down to here. Um, I am the parish attorney in West Feliciana Parish. I do a significant amount of work for Point Capi Parish government. I in fact wrote their charter. I'd work for them when they were a police jury. They engaged me to write their charter. I wrote their charter, and the jurors who didn't want the charter to pass didn't task me with any work for about a year or two after the charter passed. But that's that's the way, that's the nature of this sort of job. Having worked at the legislature where I worked for 105 members of the House, because that's how it works there, and you can't tell one that you're writing an amendment to gut the other guy's bill, and I've done that. I've had to draft a bill and then draft an amendment to gut the bill, but I have to give them both the same level of, of confidentiality. Um, so I'm used to working for a governmental body because I've done it for so long. Uh, I think I've been generally successful in the work that I've done for Plaquemines is thus far um, and would be hopeful to continue this relationship. Is there any question from the table? Mr. Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Um, uh, again, I'll thank you for your time and patience in this matter. It's been, as we all know, it's been long drawn out. We need to, should have been moved on this a while ago, but we are, we are here today. So again, thank you for your patience. I know you, you, you you've worked for us for a long time. Uh, I'll just uh, iterate on some of my sh issues, or not issues, but I shouldn't say, but comments on Mr. Garrett that I've had in the short time that I've been a council member. Uh, things I've spoke to you about on the phone, you've gotten back to me in an extremely timely manner. You put it on terms that, not the not the legal jargon, but you put it on terms that I can understand, and, and I thank you for that. Um, you, again, your resume is, uh, is very impressive on the government work you've done through the legislature, um, through, through different organizations. Um, uh, I know we've had you here since 2016, so uh, that's about what I have right now. So I'm sure I'll come up with some other. But so I just want to thank you for helping me out in some situations when you can put it on simple terms. And when, if chosen, I'm sure you'll keep that same uh, relationship going. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And and look, I I I don't have you. Nobody has to worry about hurting my feelings. I understand this is a process. I've, like I said, I've worked for elected bodies for a long time, and elections have consequences, and when a new body comes in, they want to make their own decision. I have no problem with that. So you're, no one's hurting my feelings by may, having me go through this process. I just want to make sure that's clear. Reverend Edwards? Uh, yes. Good morning, Mr. Garrett. Good morning, sir. Um, you know, I, I came to watch you as a uh, 
our parish council for a long time. Um, and I think your experience is unquestionable in terms of the legislature you rather made is impeccable. But the challenge I had with you, and I think I expressed that when I first got to the council in the first meeting, um, as it relates to redistricting, because that is personal to me. That's something that I've been dealing with for 40 years, you know, in terms of even with changing the form of government with Ernest Bruce out there. But I told you the very first meeting I went to at Pernley Hash before the meeting started that I thought you was a conflict of interest. You shouldn't have been handling that. Am I right about that? The very first meeting at Pernley Hash when you was doing the hearings around that, I shared that with you at the very beginning, beginning of the meeting, but I still watched the process. Um, with all your experience with redistricting, I, I think that while nobody legally challenged the redistricting, I think it was done poorly and bad. It just wasn't challenged. I, I think it was done poorly, man. I thought it was a conflict of interest. The other thing that uh, amazed me when I looked at your resume and being involved in an ethnic board, I thought your handling of the uh, voter register straw office case was really horrible. I, I thought that you were judge, you were an executioner. I didn't think that you were as impartial as you should have been. I think the whole display of that, to me, in a way was unethical for my understanding of integrity and the oath that you take. How that handled, I was really thoroughly surprised based on your impeccable resume that you had. But those two things was very present to me, and, I, and, and my opinion was is maybe because you were wearing too many hats and maybe because you were in a relationship with too many people, you had gotten too personal with the council and the politics of Plaquemine Parish, and it was displayed in that. And so I had some serious problems, you know, with you on that. And I don't know if you've thought about it lately, have second thoughts about how you handle that, you know. So my question would be, do you think that your handling of redistrict was really handled fairly? I, I do. And this is the thing is I've, I've done over the last two cycles, I've participated in redistricting over 50 jurisdictions, everything from the town of Amit to the city of New Orleans last cycle before last. Um, when we do redistricting, we do it as what are the rules? What are the processes? Where a line is, if, if you can have a line in two locations and both of them comply with the with all of the redistricting criterion, it's not my decision as to where that line goes. That decision is solely the member who's asking us to draw that plan. And some places you have one plan or two plans. As an example, in Orleans, we had 21 different plans that were drawn, and we drew whatever plan anyone asked. And so uh, where a particular line fell was the discretion of the elected body. I tried to do a very good job of not making the policy decision, and I usually refrain from answering questions where people go, well, do you think we should do this? Because that's not my job. That's the elected official's job. Y'all are the ones to decide whether you should do something. My job, whether I'm assisting in legal, as your straight up legal counsel or if I'm assisting in redistricting, it's whether or not you can accomplish your goal under the rules that, that, that per per pertain to you. And I know there was some controversy over that because we had essentially two competing plans and uh, one, one of the members chose to introduce the plan that uh, uh, that uh, at a meeting, and there was a discussion of, well, can you hold off and let us introduce our plan as an ordinance so that then we can consider them both at the same meeting? And the council voted not to do that um, because there, there was a separate plan that I had drawn. Um, we had even looked at, was there the ability to, to go to a different number? And what I advise is if you looked at your charter, y'all would have had to amend your charter to do that. So, and I know that people are not always happy with the outcome of a redistricting plan. And I would love for every redistricting plan to have been adopted unanimously. Some were, some were not. Some are that one vote margin. But that's ultimately the political decision for the elected officials to make. Um, now, with regard to the registrar voter matter, 
Um, I was asked by a member of the council, actually by multiple members of the yeah. council. Yes, sir. I'm going to stop you there. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask that we stick to item A, interview for the applicant for the parish council position. This is not an interview for you drawing up lines uh, for district. That's 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 not that's. Okay. I was that's just trying to respond that, to the question. That's, that's, that's not it. Well, let's stick to the questions of handling, uh, uh, dealing with parish attorney. But let me let me just say this. Uh, As uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, uh, Council Attorney, I'm sorry. Mr. the friends, I think this question is relating to me asking this question because it's about integrity. And I asked the young man before him about the same question. Um, it, it got something to do with relationship. So it is interrelated. You know why? It might be touching on some area people don't want to touch on, but that's what we got to look at having somebody who can really look at past mistakes. Because if we go ask somebody, then we got to look at an integrity issue. We got to look at that. And to me, it was the issue of integrity, and that's why I posed it because I'm using some examples. Because drawing the lines and all those things, to me, is a conflict of interest. We just asked the young man before, could he actually work for poor people? This is related to that same stuff. Maybe your mind is not where mine, but I see it interrelated and interconnected. It's not about going into that, but it's a question about the, him, his role as our counsel and the role of that was a conflict of interest. And that's what I want, that's what I'm demonstrating, it was a conf, conflict of interest. And so that's why it's germane um, to this issue. I'm through. You finished, Rev? Yes. Mr. Conovich. Yes, I'd like to thank you for your service with the parish. And uh, I disagree with Mr. Edwards. He has his opinion. I have mine. Sitting in the audience looking at it, you just seen two sides that had our side, that things in the back room you didn't hear about with the redistricting and the clerk, uh, the voter registrator. Then you seen her come up or different people coming up for the redistricting. But everything he did was on our asking. He didn't draw the map himself. He didn't draw the lines himself. He didn't go after Miss the uh, register voter. We asked him to do all the things, and he went and got the from the state their part, and I think he did a good job on both of them. Uh, I don't think he, now, I've asked him to do things, and I didn't like the answers. Sometimes that happens in, in the world. And like Mr. Newsom says, he, he explains it to where I could understand it. And everything we went out, had him do, different uh, suits, he's won, and hope he wins the next one. So we get rid of the toll, but I appreciate, appreciate your work, and that's how I feel. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that all the councilmen, everybody sitting at the table, that we keep to the agenda item, this interview of applicants for the attorney for the uh, for the council miss McCarthy I think the difficulty that we're having mr. LaFrance is that um, mr. Garrett has experience with the parish and we did not have that um, to fall back on with mr. Riley and so some council members have questions about how things were handled from that experience that we have within the parish with Mr. Garrett. And um, I know that District 8 is a uh, is a 
I think, poorly drawn district. And I, I am still curious in trying to figure out how it was drawn and um, that um, even the council member in District 8 was moved in and out of his position several times, in, in and out of his district several times. So you're saying that, or I think I heard from Mr. Kognovich that you simply did what you were asked to do. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And, and I, I would like to correct. There was no moving in and out. There were two plans that ultimately were drafted, the one that was adopted. And the one that was adopted, that it, it was adopted in exactly the same format as it was introduced. And, 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 and that there, because understand y'all did, I, you asked why there was a notion of y'all had historically had the school board and council plans identical. And so part of the decision making had to do also with the affected members of the school board. And I know there's a little carve out at a place and people are going, well, why'd you do that? I can tell you because without doing that, the school board member would have been, the incumbent school board member would have likely been redistricted out of his district. Um, again, those were policy decisions that were made by the individuals who asked us to draw plans. And there was an alternative plan. And I drew it with the fidelity that I try to do all of my work. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's significantly different because that's the policy difference that those council members wanted. And it's not for me to decide which is the better plan. It's to decide that both of the plans comply with all the rules. And then it ultimately was up to the council to decide to draw that plan. Now, some of the things that did drive it, and we get into the weeds of it, is um, in order to maintain District 7 as a majority, minority district, and make sure it had sufficient population to comply with the redistricting criterion, it necessitated District 7 reaching into uh, other districts to pick up population. And, and it had to be areas that were adjacent. Um, and it really it was almost impossible to go really west. You almost had to go north and south only. That was really the only way to do it. So that's how that happened. Okay, I'll, I'll move on from the districting to um, other issues. Where do you reside? I reside in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge. Um, almost went to college out of state, ended up deciding to stay at LSU, almost went to law school in Florida, but ultimately decided to stay in Baton Rouge. Um, for a brief period of time, I also had an apartment in Alexandria, Louisiana, when I worked for Congressman Richard Baker. Um, just because it, it, because of the nature of my work, I needed someplace uh, uh, else to sleep, and so I had a, I literally got a studio apartment in Alexandria for a period of time. But other than that, I've lived in Baton Rouge my entire life. And as you said, when you were in your opening statement, you have um, a lot of experience with local governments. Um, how does that experience from other entities help you with Blackman's Parish? One of the things that I've learned in my years of doing this is that although every parish government, every school board, every city council is different, they also have a significant amount in common. You're caught, you, I don't know if you've been to any of the police jury association conventions, but you go to those conventions and you'll find out that other parish council members around the state have, they run into very much of the same issues you run into. Now, because every charter is different, they're all slightly different. And so um, I think that having seen how lots of different places operate gives me a better understanding of the way they should operate. Because there's, you can, there's a lots of ways you can do it and still be in compliance with the law. And I think that's what people need to understand, that you don't have to do it like somebody else does it. Um, y'all are unique, for example, in the, in the fact that y'all are an elected port commission, and you're also the council, same nine people, only one in the state. But virtually every other port also is unique in the way it's set up. So I think having that variety of experience, also having police jury as opposed to home rule charter, because it is significantly different. Y'all can do virtually anything 
that your charter gives you general ability to do. Whereas a police jury, you can only do that which the legislature says you can do. And sometimes that create, creates great challenges. Um, so I think that variety of experience um, gives me a more holistic view of how local government operates. And there's just not a lot that comes up that I've never seen. Now, I will tell you, they call it the practice of law for a reason, because you always are going to have a new issue come up. But a lot of times, that experience allows you then to better address that unique issue. With your experience, do you think that when we task you to do something, it brings you to look at other possibilities that may be involved with that task? For instance, I asked, the, I asked Mr. Riley, if we tasked an attorney with item A, what would you go and look up for item A? And would you lead, would it, if it led you to B, C, D, and E, would you come back to the attorney first before you go and look up B, C, D, and E and bill us for that? If it, 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 I guess it would much depend on the task. First, I would look, if it's a fairly direct thing, and it, the first issue with, with a home rule charter government is always, how do you accomplish that under your charter? And um, once you have experience in the charter, you don't have to go look it up every time. I, I don't, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't go look up the open meetings law every time because I'm fairly, I, I'm, now I, I did have a law professor that said that practicing law from memory is malpractice, so I do like to check myself from time to time. And I've also found that Although I have a lot of experience and I may be confident in the answer, sometimes the client wants an AG opinion that supports that answer. So um, uh, that's what I usually try to do. Now, if there is some impediment, if there's something that's not going to let us do exactly that, I will oftentimes try to find out is there a way that we can accomplish that through another means. And if I can't, I'll reach back out to the person that tasked me and say, look, we can't do that. Usually what I'll go to them and say, look, we can't get from point A to point B directly. But there are there may be other ways to do it. Do you want me to look at other ways of doing it? Um, so that's that's what I usually do. And, and oftentimes it depends on the individual council member because if their request is super specific, then I'm not going to go beyond it without getting more authority. But if their request is more general, just accomplish this ultimate goal, then I believe I'm tasked with figuring out what are the paths to that goal. And if I can figure out multiple paths, I'll give you multiple paths and, again, let you make the policy decision. So you would, I think I just heard you say that you would do A, but you would also do B and C as research and bring it back to the council member. If, 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 it, if, it, if, if it did not appear as though we could go straight to A, um, I, would, I would have to rely on the communication with the council member as to whether or not they only wanted to go straight to A. For example, Mr. Kognovich referenced sometimes, I want to do X, and I'm, my answer will be, you can't do X. Now, my next question will usually be, but what are, what are you really trying to get at? What is the policy piece? Because maybe we can get you close or maybe we can accomplish the general policy goal a different way. Do you want me to look into that? Okay. I'm looking at billable hours. And while I do that, I'm wondering, would you be amenable to renegotiating the contract that we have with you? Um, I presume that there will be a new contract. Um, frankly, it's one of the issues um, the – one of the things I can tell you is that of all of my local government clients, and that includes all the way down to the Tinsall Parish Police Jury, the Plaquemines Parish Council is my lowest hourly rated client. Y'all pay me less per hour than every other parish government that I do work for. Um, at the time that I accepted the contract, that the 175 was a, was my standard hourly rate. Mm -hmm. um, that is well within the AG fee schedule. The AG fee schedule, y'all noted, y'all voted on on the DeWire Shuffrin contract a, a couple months ago. Uh, the AG fee schedule has more opening there. And certainly, if there are other t ways that you want to structure the contract as far as how I'm tasked, I'm, I, I presume there will be a new contract. That's I think that's what this process is. Um, you you presume that the contract will be more than 175 an hour. 
I would I would request it simply because, and again, that's something we'll negotiate because you you've already made the decision to pay other legal counsel that higher rate, and I can understand why you, you know because I think they were at 175 back when I when I started at 175, mm -hmm. um, and and you know that's the the individual language or terms of the contract. I think each one of them would be negotiated, and if ultimately you said no, we're not willing to pay more than X, then ultimately I'd have to make that decision. Uh, because that's how contracts work. It, it may be um, too early to ask, but do you have an idea which you would expect to be paid? Um, most of my other clients who used to be at 175 back in 2016 are up to 220. Um, I understand that's a pretty big jump, um, but and what I would have proposed would have been 200. Uh, it's still it's still about 20 dollars an hour. I think it's 20 dollars an hour lower. In which I'll just approve for Dwyer Shufferin. Um, it is still lower than what most of my other clients pay. They re recently, my other clients just went up to 220 um, in the past two years. Um, but I understand, you know, because y'all had not gone up to that next increment. Most of them at 175 had already gone to 200 a number of years ago. Um, so I think 200 is appropriate. It's within the AG fee schedule. It's actually about $25 less an hour than the AG fee schedule max rate, uh, and it's less than what y'all approved for the Dwyer Suffern firm. So, Okay. I see on the billable hours that on February 24th, 22nd, when we had a meeting in Point Lahash, we were billed eight hours. I'm just wondering, I don't think we were in session for eight hours, so do you begin your billing from when you leave Baton Rouge to before? Uh, till you get to Point Lahash and the back to Baton Rouge, or how do yeah. you bill? Yeah, if you if you look at my contract, and, and I made this decision a long time ago when I started working for local governments, is, is that I was not going to have a 19-page contract and nickel and dime you for, because I've worked at the big law firm. I've seen those contracts that bill you every time they use a file folder, and they bill you for copies at their own office and so forth like that. Um, I look at what I, I don't. First of all, the, the administrative—that's administrative nightmare—and I think it's—I think that's part of my overhead is what I consider it. If I make a photocopy at my office or print something at my office, that's part of my overhead. What I sell is my time and experience. And if I have to drive to Tensaw, they pay me to drive to Tensaw. If I drive to a hearing in Madison Parish, I've got—I've got one later this month. I'll be going to uh, Madison Parish for a hearing, and. I, it's the same way I bill when I drive to Point Capi. It's the same way I bill when I drive to West Luciana. And I understand that. And, and now I don't. I don't. I also don't then bill mileage, and I don't bill any of other expenses. Uh, the only thing that gets billed in my contract is my time. The only time that there's any kind of cost is when it is a court cost. For example, if I have to, and and, and that doesn't really come into play a lot with y'all, simply because. When we are, when a public body is involved in litigation in Louisiana, you don't prepay the clerk of court. Um, the only other time that I've gotten that I've billed for an expense is if if we have a deposition and I have to pay for a deposition. I usually I what I do is I'll pay the deposition and then I'll bill for the cost of the deposition. Um, but otherwise, you're simply buying my time. Okay, I was trying to think of the the cost for our upcoming um, attorney needs. But I would uh, like to thank you for coming today. And I'm, I, again, I as well, I, am, I apologize for it being such a lengthy process. And um, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Edwards? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I want to go back to um, Mr. Um, Konovich. My question with the register of voters about due process. Due process is a key part of the law. And, but you answered my question by saying he wasn't providing due process because he was doing what you all told him. But it goes back then to something, uh, uh, this Patty asked a question about saying that no people are entitled to due process. You know, I'm not a lawyer, but I spent 25 years as a paralegal with some, some great attorneys in New Orleans. And I just know due process is a key thing. And I, I, I felt, and like a lot of other people, that the due process part wasn't involved in that process. And I just think if we're going to have a person who's a counsel for the uh, parish, 
then we got to make sure that everybody get due process. So my question to tie it into with this interview was about due process, not about whether I was in the back room or not, or whether I was on the council, but due process wasn't used in that process. And my other question, when I, so are you working for any other clients besides the Black and Paris government at this time? Do you have any other clients besides us? Yes, sir. Um, and I can tell from the top of my head, I, I do a regular work for the Madison Parish Police Jury, regular work for the Tinsel Parish Police Jury, um, um, regular work for the West Feliciana Parish government, regular work for the Point Capi Parish government, regular work for the West Baton Rouge Parish government. Um, I also, um, another part of my practice is government relations, and I represent the Louisiana School Boards Association. I also represent the St. Tammany Parish School Board. In the past, I've also done legal work for the St. James Parish School Board and for the Natchitoches Parish uh, government. And uh, those are the ones that I think, and, and also one of, my, one of my clients is the West Baton Rouge Parish Library Board. Um, and uh, I also have a small portion of my practice, which is private, pri uh, private clients, mainly friends of mine. I do legal work for their businesses. Uh, I represent a company called SNS Supplies on a regular basis, the owner of which stood it and was the best man in my wedding. I've known him since we were kids. So, you know, he calls me. Um, I, uh, I, I have, <laughs> I, I assist, because I'm with the school board association, I assist school boards all over the state. Um, just like I did when I was at the Police Jury Association. So those are really my main clients. I have a couple of, every once in a while, someone asks me to do an individual thing. Um, I limit my practice significantly to governmental law and government relations. Um, I, 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 I try not to, uh, to get involved in areas of law that I don't feel like that I have a sufficient level of expertise to provide my clients with the best. You know, I, I didn't do my mom's estate planning. I had my mom hire us as an estate's attorney. Um, and, you know, I, when, when a friend of mine's son got a DWI, I found him a criminal attorney to handle it because that's not, that's not what my expertise is. So. And I want to thank you for, because you have given me some advice that was accurate. So I also want to recognize, I appreciate and that since I've been a councilman. So I really appreciate that advice also. You're welcome. Mr. Schultz. Without going into too much detail, because it's an active case, the bridge, how, if we decide to go with Ms. O'Reilly, how indirectly will that impact your services for that? Well, and, and it's interesting because I think it's like to kind of come up today a little bit, and that is um, based upon what was passed in March, the because there was a previously, because I was a council attorney, but since the port is actually going to be the party, I felt it 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 was necessary to have a separate contract and we did issue a contract that Mr. Blink had signed. I consider since y'all opted not to do this since the prior council opted not to move forward, I kind of consider that contract over. So uh I since he since there's been a subsequent resolution, um part of that resolution was to direct Mr. Gooey to enter into a contract with me for that. In fact I've I've sent him that contract and just for all for all of you to know, I kept it at the 175 an hour simply because that's what the prior one was, and I just didn't feel like it was appropriate to bump it up at that time. Um, I think it is a separate contract from the council attorney contract, and the reason being is because although this council is actually a juridic entity, and we know that because the Fourth Circuit ruled that way in a case that I handled, y'all can actually sue and be sued in your own name. You're one of the few councils in the state that can do that. The That lawsuit for technical reasons, has to be filed by the port. It is the port, not the council per se, that has that authority. So I think there would need to be a special contract. I could not be your council attorney, and I could still be the attorney to handle that case if y'all so chose to be me. Okay, yeah, that, that's why. That's how I read the, con uh, right. the resolution, because it was my resolution, and that's how <laughs> I read it. But I just wanted to make sure that that was my understanding, because you were you researched that issue a lot. And, and know all the ins and outs of what's going on there. So that's why I just wanted to double check on that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Mr. Juricic. Mr. Garrett, yes, sir. once again, appreciate you reapplying. And, uh, and you know, just, uh, you know, you've done a good job to date. You know, I feel like you've been, uh, you've been, you know, doing a great job with us. Uh, 
And your qualifications, definitely your resumes, you know, definitely impressive. One of the things I asked uh, Mr. Riley was, instead of doing a contract, would you willing to do be an at will? In other words, we can, you know, feel like we don't have to have a solid contract. We can decide at any time to terminate your services if, if need be. Well, if you look at the current contract, you can already do that. Okay. Um, as an attorney, I'm required to have a written contract, and you're required to have a written contract with your lawyer to pay me hourly. That's, that's required by law. So there has to be a contract. If you'll notice, my contract is a task contract. Um, you can stop, you can, y'all can fire me anytime you want. And first of all, any lawyer that says that you, he can lock you into a multi month or multi year contract or a one year, a full one year contract, that's, you need to be able to fire your lawyer whenever you don't think your lawyer is, should be your lawyer, period. And so, um, at, at any time, and, if, and that's the way my current contract, and it's the way the contract with all of my parish governments are phrased. I don't have a, a year contract with people. Um, I do a contract. They can always terminate it at will. So I, I am essentially at will and only do the work you task me to do. Uh, outside of the council, do you have the, the, you know, the council meetings? Do you have any other interaction in Plaquemines Parish? Do you attend functions? Do you... Inter interact with the communities in any fashion? No. Um, I, the nature of my practice, uh, and this is going to sound odd, I'm, I'm almost a hired gun. I don't. I try not to be in the po local politics because I think it, it would make it makes it harder to give you objective legal advice if there's some political goal that I think needs to be accomplished. I leave the political goals to y'all. Um, the only time I do anything in Plaquemines Parish is when y'all task me to do something in Plaquemines Parish. And that goes for West Feliciana, and it goes for Point Capi, and it goes for Tensaw, and every other place that I do work. Okay. Uh, I know Ms. McCarty asked you a question about the four times moved. There is a timeline when there was, you know, District 8 was moved in and out four times. Uh, and I know that may have been a registrar voters issue. Not your issue, uh, but I know that the council moved very fast to pass that map, and the map was extremely slow getting to us. A real map that was legible did not come out till August 11th. You were the demographer, right? Yeah, that well, it was technically your contract was with Strategic Demographics. I had a contract with them. Um, that's how me and Dr. Blair, who's the other, he's the owner of Strategic Demographics, handled it um, when. In, I can tell you the map stayed the same. I think there was an issue at the Registrar Voters Office um, over whether or not one of the new precincts that was created, uh, how that was going to be impacted. And the so I think, it was, at least it's my understanding from other people, that, they were, that the Registrar put certain addresses in the district, then they took them out of the district, then put them back in the district. But the map was the same. The shape file never changed. The, I understand when you see a map, it's just a, a, a printed representation. And the, the most legible map is the one that we actually have printed through a third party vendor. It's that big three foot by four foot map and it's a big digital map. It's got a huge amount of, of data in it as opposed to when we take the actual computer screen and we create a map and we, the most I can print in my office was 13 by 19. And you don't get as much detail as you get in the larger ones. Um, and it did take a while to get, because we, we had, we send those big maps off to be printed and, uh, to get those. But as far as the data in the plan, the data in the plan is exact, that, that that's in place right now is exactly the data that was in the plan when it was introduced. And adopted, and the speed at which it was adopted. Again, that was a decision of the council. They clearly could have waited a, a couple of weeks and had both plans to be voted on, but the council opted not to do that. Right, and I mean just the fact that it was voted on in February, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, and by July we still never had a big legible map. There was still a lot of discrepancies moving things around during qualifying, and. The map, the actual map that people could actually read did not come out till August 11th. I felt like between February 
and August 11th, that's a lot of time. You know, March, April, May, June, July, we had a lot of time to get a, a legible map that everyone could read. So, and then I know once we had the issue with registrar voters, you then became an investigator. Do you feel like you should have recused yourself being the council attorney, demographer? Should you have recused yourself from being an investigator also? No, and I'll tell you why. The first communication that I had, and I had it from multiple council members, with regard to the registrar of voters, didn't have anything to do with the redistricting plan. It had to do with an assertion that the registrar of voters was not doing their job. They weren't going to work. And so the, the legal issue was put to me is, well, we appointed her, can't we fire her? And the legal advice that I gave, that I stand by, is that no, the council can't fire her. There is a process in the law. And the plot process requires that the council develop a basis upon which to terminate the registrar. If that's what they wish to happen, they then have to adopt a resolution urging the State Board of Election Supervisors to take that action. And then it's only the State Board of Election Supervisors who can actually terminate a registrar. But they will not consider the termination of a registrar without that resolution. That's the legal process. So I began looking at that request. Was, was there any information that would have justified removing the registrar. It was actually not until we got into that, looking at sort of when the registrar was, whether they were going to work or not, that uh, we began developing through public records um, issues that pertained to the redistricting plan. Um, and in discussions with the Secretary of State's office, they were concerned that it was there was actually more problems than the registrar not just being at work and that's how the rest of that information uh, was developed um, it wasn't about whether the plan was good or bad the secretary of state's office had already signed off on the plan um, the plan was submitted uh, for example one of the allegations was that the plan was not submitted timely but in fact it was i mean secretary of state's office records prove that um, and that's when all the other stuff came out now, there was stuff that having to do with beyond just not going to work, that's when we determined uh, that, and the evidence indicated that there was, there had been uh, and I, act, you, you, it, just other things. I, and so I, I we, that, that, and that whole, and again, that was all part of that. I know it got built into I don't need the, the plan was good or bad. I just asked right. the question. It was a right. simple yes or no question. No, I'm sorry. Should you have recused yourself? And no. Just as, you know, Chairman LaFrance said, we don't want to mention any too much detail. I apologize for getting too far into it. No. I have told if you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you how to build a clock. I hear you. But, well, look, I really appreciate you answering these questions, and I yield. Certainly. Mr. Newsom. Yes. One, one just simple, one last, I guess simple, and there's no simple questions, I guess. Uh, I see on your resume you have vast knowledge of redistricting. Looks like it goes back all the way to 2011. Um, with the uh, contract with strategic demogra demographics, did they approach you or did you approach them? Actually, I, I'm sort of both in the sense that um, my initiation in redistricting began in the 2000 cycle. I was the attorney for House and Governmental Affairs, and that's the, that's the committee in the House that handles redistricting. So that's when I first got into it. After I left them, um, I went to work with a group called Redistricting LLC, which was owned by, uh, at the time, then uh, uh, Senate Secretary Glenn Kep And Dr. Blair and I both worked with Mr. Kep through contracts that Redistricting LLC had, and we did 32 jurisdictions in the 2010 cycle. Uh, Mr. Kep actually passed away um, right around uh, 2020. And so, and, and had gotten older and we didn't think he was going to do it. So Dr. Blair and I, Dr. Blair went and formed his own company. And that's when I went to work for Dr. Blair. I'm done. Thank you. Any more questions from the table? Mr. Garrett, I'd like to thank you for coming and participating in the interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Y'all have a good day. We'll move to the next item, please. Item three, executive session. 
A, executive session pursuant to LRS 4216A1 to discuss the character and professional competence of the following individuals. Avery M. Riley, Jr., Danny P. Garrett III. Do I have a motion? Motion by Mr. Conover, seconded by Mr. Schultz. All in favor? And the measure passes 8-0. We'll go to executive session at 11-18. We'll return from executive session at 11-46 a.m. No binding or final decision was made in executive session. We'll move to item 4. Item four, resolutions wherein suspen suspension is being sought. A, a res- We'll withdraw that. Okay. And I'll entertain a motion, motion to, adjourn. to adjourn. We have a motion by Mr. Conover, seconded by Mr. Newsom. Machines are open. And the message passes 8-0. We'll have adjournment at... 11.47 a.m.